Hello, my name is Jesse Romans, and I am the Committee Administrator for the Intimate Partner Violence Task Force at the American College of Surgeons. Thank you for joining us today for Break the Cycle Part 2, an Intimate Partner Violence Conversation. This webinar is hosted by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, the American College of Surgeons, the American Urogynecological Society, and the Society for Gynecologic Surgeons. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Bonney, our moderator. Dr. Stephanie Bonney is an Associate Professor of Surgery at Hackensack University Medical School and the Chief of Trauma and Critical Care Surgery and the Trauma Medical Director at Hackensack University Medical Center. Dr. Bonney's interests primarily center around leveraging the trauma system in the United States to integrate a health equity and prevention platform into the existing system. To this end, she serves on multiple violence work groups in her role as the vice chair for the New Jersey chapter at the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. In 2020, she co-authored a book entitled, Why Are We Losing the War on Gun Violence in the United States? She has authored over 70 peer-reviewed publications, six book chapters, and has earned $7 million in career funding centering on the epidemiology of injury and violence best practices for violence intervention, and the integration of social de detriments of health into patient care. Thank you, Dr. Bonnie, for moderating today's webinar. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today on our conversation on intimate partner violence. Today, we'll discuss the resources that are available to surgeons who are experiencing or suspecting intimate partner violence in the surgical community. Intimate partner violence has a global presence across gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic classes, and relationships. It affects surgeons and their friends, family members, and patients. We are joined today by Drs. DeAndrea Joseph, Carrie Sims, and Christine Lovato. Dr. Joseph is the Chief of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at NYU Langone Hospital in Long Island. She's the first female um, and first person of color to hold this position. Her research is on clinical outcomes with a focus on injury prevention for intimate partner violence, gun violence, falls, and motor vehicle collisions. Dr. Joseph has been the recipient of the Golden Apple Teaching Award and the Humanitarian Award from the Governor of New Jersey. She's been admitted into the New England Surgical Society and serves on several national committees at the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, the Society for Critical Care Medicine, the American College of Surgeons, where she is currently the Vice Chair of the Intimate Partner Violence Task Force. Next, we welcome Dr. Carrie Sims. Dr. Sims is a Professor of Surgery and the Division Director at The Ohio State University, uh, where she joined in January of 2020. She holds the first Olga Jonasson MD Professorship in Surgery Award, which was established to recognize surgeons who encourage and enable female surgeons to realize their professional and research goals. She's an accomplished surgeon and established researcher with a basic science laboratory focused on mitochondrial dysfunction in late stage hemorrhagic shock. She's given nearly 50 invited lectures, published 68 articles, um, and co-authored over, over 85 abstracts. She's taken multiple leadership courses through the American College of Surgeons, the Penn Medicine Leadership Academy, the Association of uh, American Medical Colleges, and the Society of University Surgeons. Finally, we welcome Dr. Christine Lovato. Dr. Lovato is board certified in general surgery and has completed her training and certification in robotic surgery, as well as obtaining the American Board of Surgery Focus Practice, practice Designation in Bariatric Surgery. She's an assistant clinical professor at the University of Arizona Phoenix College of Medicine and serves as the site director for bariatric surgery for the University of Arizona Phoenix College of Medicine and the Crichton University School of Medicine Family Medicine Program. She's the section chief for bariatric surgery at Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix and serves on the Medical Executive Council. She's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and is a member of the Arizona Medical Association, the American Medical Association, the Obesity Society, the Obesity Advocacy Coalition. And she serves as a member of the Health Policy and Advocacy Committee of the American College of Surgeons, as well as on the Intimate Partner um, Violence Task Force. 
She's a star for advocacy in the state of Arizona and for the local cha chapter of ASMBS, as well as the co-chair of the communications committee. So thank you all for being here today. Um, the way we are um, doing the, the talk today is really as a Q&A and as an open discussion. And at the end, we'll have Q&A as well from um, some of our audience members. If you have um, questions for anyone in the panel at any point during the talk, please submit them through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will go ahead and see if we can get those questions answered. Um, but I am going to go ahead and get started. So um, one of the questions we have is in our field, we see uh, people who have, you know, big careers who are, um, who are working hard and have, you know, established um, uh, careers who have done a lot with their lives and their education. And so sometimes um, this doesn't seem like the typical uh, group that you might expect or suspect intimate partner violence. So let's say that you heard somebody fighting with their partner on the phone in the staff lounge or in the surgeon's lounge. What's the difference between someone who's in conflict with their partner and intimate partner violence? I can go ahead and um, answer that question, Stephanie. So, and it is true, you know, we um, have blinders on because we, um, again, have worked so hard and, and achieved so much in our life. And so I think one of the most important things um, that we need to make sure that people understand is that, you know, intimate partner violence is not, uh, not always a black eye. It's not always bruises. Um, it's often very insidious. Um, and in my experience, it was that way, you know, I was in a relationship just like that, where we would constantly fight over the phone. Uh, and that was someone I was with for 24 years. It was my family. So I found myself making a lot of excuses um, for him and his behavior. Um, and so I think, you know, it's important to have that conversation with that colleague, you know, fights are fights. We all have relationships and fights are normal. Um, if you start to see a lot of other signs in that colleague, you know, missing work, um, constant messaging throughout the day, um, you know, if they seem uh, that they are struggling a little bit more just to keep up in general, it's, you know, very reasonable to ask them if everything's okay. I certainly wish someone would have asked me early on um, because I did. I hit it very, very well uh, on purpose. I think I Steph, I don't know if you just wanted us to jump in. So, but um, you know, I think it's so important about asking a question, and you are absolutely correct. Um, if you're in a relationship, you're going to have a fight. It's, there's something wrong with that. But it is really what the person appears, what the, what that individual on the receiving end looks like afterwards, and and, and the subtle signs you see of. Uh, withdrawing from uh, from work, withdrawing from friends, and and withdrawing from company. And you're right. I I I like what you said, Christine, about the messaging um, during the day. You know, if you have somebody who's constantly having to respond to questions during the day, that's that that's a, a big red flag. Um, so it 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 very often isn't the black eye at the initial presentation. It is in fact, everything but that. And, and that's the unfortunate part of it. So I would just like to chime in a little bit. I think um, when you observe something like that, um, you know, anytime that happens, we reach out to our friends and, um, you know, just want to check in and see, you know, how things are going. Um, but you can also ask some more probing questions. You know, you can start off by saying, you know, hey, listen, I heard that you were having this you know, fight with your husband or whatever. Gosh, it sounds really challenging. Is everything going okay? And if, you know, do a little bit more probing about, you know, um, does this happen often? Uh, you know, um, do you feel safe at home? Um, do, you, do your children, do you feel like your children are safe? You know, and just, just open up the dialogue. I think um, you know people who are experiencing um, intimate partner violence may not recognize that it's intimate partner violence. It may just be 
you know, how they how they interact and that's their norm. Um, I think that there are a lot of times where, you know, um, people who have observed intimate partner violence in their own homes um, as children think that that's actually normal behavior. That's how, that's what marriage is, you know, that it's a, it's a, you know, it, it's not always pleasant. It's a struggle sometimes and we, we, we have fights. And um, so just asking more in-depth questions. And if the person um, doesn't want to um, reveal, which many people who are experiencing intimate par partner violence may not feel comfortable sort of disclosing that at the very beginning of the conversation, um, just letting that person know that you're there for them um, as a resource or that if they want to talk or, you know, if things get heated or if there's anything that you can do um, to help them out, I think can open up that that dialogue. Um, and then, you know, as you continue to have conversations with the person, you know, just letting them know that it's, you know, that, it, that you're there as a supportive person, but, you know, that sort of challenge the normative behavior uh, that's happening and say, so you, you know, like, you know, no, no, you, you don't always have to have someone like looking over your shoulder and telling you what to do and, um, you know, following up and whatever. Um, that's not normal, healthy relationship stuff because I think the person who's in the middle of it may think that this is just pretty standard par for the course relationship stuff. And I think it was, you, you made a really great point, Dr. Lovato, that, that the black eye isn't the first thing that happens. You know, it's a it's a whole um, pattern of behavior in which the uh, the partner really wants to exert control over uh, the uh, the person. In this case, the the surgeon in the in the staff lounge, um, and it's it's about control. And when they feel like they can't exert that control, that they're losing that control, it can often escalate to those more violent behaviors. But it starts off, as you said, very insidious. It's about you know controlling your you know schedule, controlling your uh, contacts, controlling your finances, controlling you know using your children or pets as uh, leverage, um, and I, I think that that is um, you know something that many people who aren't necessarily experiencing it may not recognize, and even when you are experiencing it, it may be considered normative behavior because that's what you've experienced. You know, it's it's people who are victims of intimate partner violence don't recognize that they are in fact victims. They just think this is living. Thank you. I'm gonna actually pivot to um, a question from the audience and there's, there's a little bit to unpack in this question. So I think I might um, parse it out a little bit for us. So the question is, um, I am supporting a close friend who is in residency as she navigates intimate partner violence. Um, she has a child and is pregnant with another child. Is there a policy within the American Board of Surgery to allow for time off that doesn't need to be paid back for trainees who are navigating IPV? So for me, I think there's kind of three points and maybe we should take them one at a time. One is if you're a surgeon or a faculty member or anybody who is in a um, relative uh, leadership position or, or um, some sort of power differential, and you're concerned that one of your direct reports, a resident, a student is experiencing IPV, uh, what, what can we do if you suspect this is happening in one of your residents or trainees? That, that's a, an, um, an excellent question and um, a difficult one. And first of all, to the person who posted it, um, you know, thank you for being supportive to your friend and being there for that person because more than anything else um, what the individual experiences is the shame of you know we're all type a personality all driven and it's the shame that you experience that that may actually be happening to you so having somebody supportive is, is huge with respect to the um uh the abs and whether they have actually um policies in place uh, i'm going to defer a bit to to dr sims but I do want to say that there is the ACS toolkit. Uh, you know, we were um, discussing this uh, just last night. The ACS toolkit uh, that can that gives you like a how-to almost guideline with respect to separating yourself from 
uh, the 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 uh, situation. Uh, I think the, the 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 writer that was more specific with regards to uh, is there, if I understood the question correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Bonnie, is there a way that perhaps the individual can maybe be excused from residency from a while, for a while? I think that that what the question was being asked, and I'm not sure that there is something that is in place. I do know that there are tons of resources, and the first step is about reaching out and um, Again, um, I should be pulling up the toolkit right here, but with respect to the resident and being allowed to take time off, I'm not clear on that. I'm not sure if anybody else has any thoughts. So I, I think, um, you know, this is an excellent question. And I, I think that when people are experiencing intimate partner violence, you do need time to um, not only process it psychologically, but also to, you know, move, get yourself a safe space, um, you know, have support. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it must be very challenging uh, to be a resident with, you know, one child and one child on the way. I mean, regardless of whether intimate partner violence is in the mix. So the, the thing that I would recommend would be that they talk to their um, program director. Um, they investigate, um, you know, what are the policies for that particular institution. Um, I think that this qualifies under the Family Medical Leave Act so that they would be able to take time off um, that is protected time, and then um, contact the um, American College of Surgeons. There have been in the past um, opportunities to, you know, uh, decrease the amount of, uh, you know, payback time, if you will. Um, we, we see this often when people have pregnancies and they have to like pay back their maternity leave or whatever. Um, and there's certainly policies for that. So the, I think the first step would be to um, really work with the, the program, the residency program director um, and let them know what's going on. Um, the, you can have protected time off that's fed, federally sanctioned through the FMLA um, and then um, work toward making sure that the, um, the cases and things that are um, uh, requirements for graduation are in place. Um, and that, uh, you know, I think that reaching out directly to the American College of Surgeons um, can be very helpful. Um, and also to the American Board of Surgery, uh, which is really the other, our dual partnership uh, with uh, training and, and verification. I hope that helps. There are, the, there are laws too that are specific, but they tend to vary from state to state. So there are laws that are specific to the state as well. So that's certainly something you can identify in the toolkit. And, but I, I, you know, I wanted to hear what our colleague, um, um, Dr. Lovato, I don't know if you had. Thank you. No, I just, you know, I uh, don't have a lot to add in regards to, you know, the ability to take the time off and everything. Um, I was going to mention the FMLA, um, you know, Family Medical Leave Act does cover these things. And so it's important to make sure they're utilizing all those resources. But also, you know, just to speak to the fact that she's dealing with what she's dealing with um, or that they're dealing with what they're dealing with, you know, um, finding some resource locally uh, is important. I will put this out there that I, I utilized an app um, you know, to help me really organize my thoughts and, and figure out what it was I needed to do, um, in order to move to the next phase of my life safely. And um, I think, I think that's a really important thing, the, um, the, the whole safety component of it, um, because, um, you know, intimate partner violence often spills over into the workplace, something close to 60% of all mass shootings are associated with intimate partner violence. Um, the, uh, you know, the time that you are leaving your partner um, is probably the most dangerous time of that relationship, uh, just in terms of safety. And so really working with um, your residency program director, your colleagues, and even um, honestly, HR at your institution and security, um, so that people know that, that you have a collective plan uh, so that you are safe. Um, you know, I think that this, um, it may seem like overkill, um, but, you know, we have certainly, I have certainly um, had to guide some of my colleagues in the past through this process. And it really does like, 
you want to make sure that you know the that the the person is safe and also his or her um, colleagues and and the hospital are safe because we have had instances not necessarily at the Ohio State but instances where um, the um, the partner um, tracks down the uh, the usually typically a woman and then um, has it becomes violent toward the whole. Place. So I think it's uh, really important to try to do that safely. And that includes, you know, uh, navigating this process with your uh, residency director, your friends, you know, potentially HR and security at your institution. Yeah, I think the key, the take, the take home message here, the key things are, even though this may seem uh, initially benign, it's not, and that this can rapidly escalate. And that, so this is a safety issue for the Sindhidrill and for the children, and that there are resources out there and people who want to help. And I think the very nature of this, of having this webinar is to really demonstrate that there are things that can be done. Um, and, and just as, you know, just a, the toolkit is uh, that's put out, we put it in the chat. Um, it really does have a, like a, a whole, strategy uh, to keep you safe uh, during this transition of of leaving the abusive partner. Mm -hmm. um, so it has a lot of resources. Yeah, I'd like to trans uh, uh, kind of move into or the conversations kind of naturally going gone here, but I see another comment in the chat. Um, I'm not going to read it in in detail, but um, there was a um, there's a comment that a friend and fellow chief resident was murdered by her husband. Um, and the, the point being made here is that sometimes the perpetrator is in the same residency program um, or it's going, there's a relationship that's um, experiencing intimate partner violence between two residents in the same hospital or two, two surgeons in the same hospital. Um, and then, and I just wanna um, make two other points which is one, um, our colleague, uh, Tamara O'Neill, um, who is an emergency medicine physician in Chicago who was killed when her boyfriend came into the emergency room and shot her and shot several other people as well. Um, and then um, there's also a, um, uh, th there's also been some recent issues around stalking and um, stalking is maybe not an intimate partner, um, but certainly unwelcome stocking of physicians. So my question or my comment is, um, what should we be doing if we're worried about the safety of our, you know, our practice or the people in our workplace based on what's happening in someone else's relationship if we're concerned that there may be a perpetrator who will come to the hospital and hurt one of, you know, hurt us or hurt um, uh, people in the workplace? So I, I think it's a very challenging thing, um, but I, I think involving your security uh, early in the process is vital. Security and legal, honestly, um, to to and make sure that you know the proper steps are taken. That there's uh, you know there's you know um, that person isn't allowed to come into the the hospital. I also think working with law enforcement uh, and and Dr. Lovato, I think you can speak to this about putting out restraining orders and things like that. Um, it's you know very important. I think it's a little bit trickier when the um, the perpetrator and the victim are in the same residency program, but you can sort of see how sometimes that would happen. And I think that speaks to the the concept that you know. Uh, victims and perpetrators are just human beings in the society that we live in and that you are going to, um, you know, if if there are one in four women or and one in seven men who are victims of intimate partner violence, those people are gonna be in our workplace and the perpetrators of that violence also um, are normal human beings who are in our workplace. And so, um, you know, I think that's where the residency director can sort of like intervene because in general, people who are victims um, are perpetrators of intimate partner violence are also perpetrators of other violence, uh, you know, whether it's um, unprofessional behavior, um, um, you know, and, and really calling out behavior that's inappropriate and getting that person help um, whether it's depression or um, anger management or what have you, sometimes coaching can help. But but 
actually does calling out behavior that is inappropriate um, um, can hold the perpetrator to task and get them the help they need as well. Um, but I would like to hear uh, Dr. Lovato's, because uh, I know that you have a very powerful um, life experience with this. So uh, Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, and, and I, a very good point, you know, a lot of the resources that are available to victims do have resources that are available to perpetrators as well. And we do need to help them uh, work through what they're dealing with also. Um, the, you know, as far as the protection of, uh, of yourself, you know, in your workplace, I mean, that person has to be ready to file an order of protection. Um, it's not easy to file it. You know, uh, I had to take a whole day off of work uh, to go down to the courthouse and, and do it. Um, it can be a little jarring. Um, and so important to warn folks who are going to do this, you do have to testify in front of a judge about your experience and, and why you want this order of protection. The nice part is that you can request that that person um, give up all of their weapons, including knives or um, guns. Of course, that's being questioned now um, in our wonderful Supreme Court, but I'm hoping that will not happen. Uh, and the order of protection now uh, here in Arizona is good for two years. Um, that varies state by state. Um, it used to be just one year, which was just not enough time. Um, and I would definitely say, you know, if that person is ready to do this and file that order of protection, um, it will make a huge difference uh, for them. Now, of course, doesn't guarantee safety, but it certainly does help. Uh, and then I would say, you know, be very aggressive in making sure that you're documenting all of the things that that person might be doing to violate that order of protection. Um, you know, the court is very aggressive in making sure that they uh, hold that person accountable if they violate that order. Um, and so that would be a very important point to tell yeah. anyone who's going to file one. You know, thank you, Dr. Lavada. I wanted to, like, um, and I remember we had a recent meeting and we talked about the fact that a lot of the people who are perpetrators were actually victims themselves. And that is in no way excusing the behavior. Um, uh, but what Dr. Sims said about calling out or calling in or whichever way you want to describe it. Like, I like to think calling in, going to that person and, and saying that I see what you're doing. Um, on a personal note, I was just recently, um, one of my uh, very close friends made aware that um, th this woman just had a very, very public um, uh, physical assault by her spouse. Um, and what was most distressing to me was that this was something seemingly that everybody knew about. I happen not to live there anymore. And it was sort of like, well, you know, she's the one going back and, and trying to educate and say that this is part of a syndrome and this is part of a, a state and this person doesn't really want to go back, but this person who is the victim is is you know when you seemingly go back that 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 this person needs help, and that the other person, the perpetrator, who happens to also be your friend, um, <clears throat> seeing that there were so many people who were like, oh yeah, I don't speak with him anymore, I don't do this with him anymore, and I'm like, well, that's not really helping the situation, you know, so. You cannot, what, I'm, what I think I'm trying to say is that you cannot be a bystander in this situation. You have to jump in on some level of this person. You know, we are all accountable to a person or persons who are in that horrible cycle and that there are tons of people out there who you can, with whom you can reach out and, you know, understand what it is that you're supposed to do. I mean, it's a little difficult for me speaking because, you know, I come from a culture that's very, 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 very private. <laughs> you know, and you don't air your dirty laundry. And this is something I was shocked. I, I It was like, oh yeah, this happens. Oh, we don't speak and we don't invite him. Well, you're not helping. So you, you cannot be a bystander. You have to step up and I think, and you have a responsibility to intervene. 
I, I think your point of if you see something, say something, um, you know, whether it's at like just going in with curiosity, um, you know, I think that's probably the best approach. And certainly, you know, not doing if you're going to be speaking to the perpetrator, not doing it in the heat of the moment, uh, you know, where you just witnessed it. But, you know, letting things simmer down and then, um, you know, pulling that person aside and be like, hey, you know, like I, I saw this and, you know, I, I'm worried about you because this is a normal behavior. You know, you know, normal people don't strike their loved ones. Um, or saying it in some way that, you know, hopefully you have a relationship with that person. The other thing that I would sort of say is that, um, you know, when it comes to uh, interventions for the perpetrator, like having someone that that person respects um, intervene will carry way more weight than someone that they, you know, necessarily appear or whatever. But having having the um you know, calling it out. I think if you you have to sort of call out, just like we call out unprofessional behavior, uh, you know, or you, with our residents or our faculty or whatever, like you have to call it out and and say that this, you know, this isn't what we do at this institution. This isn't how we behave. But then, you know, taking it a, a, a step further and sort of asking about their own mental health, um, you know, are they depressed? You know, are they drinking more than usual? Are they under a lot of stress? What are the resources that are available for that person, because usually in general, it's not about, um, it's not just one area of their life that is, uh, you know, going off the rails. It, it really is uh, many factors that then compound and then build up and then they strike out, uh, you know, or try to exert power because they're really trying to get control over their own life, which is chaotic. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, the there is a very high incidence of um, murder suicide. So, you know, they the, uh, the the perpetrator will, you know, strike out uh, and you know hurt the 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 victim, and then they will in turn kill themselves. So there there's a collinearity of that, um, you know, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, loss of control and their behavior towards their intimate partner. It is not a siloed event. Um, so I think that that's super important that we call out the behaviors and when we see them. Um, and I think it's really hard to do that actually, because like, you know, you know, we- There's, there's, a, there's an inherent fear too on the part absolutely. of the person who's doing it. So I, I'm curious, actually, I want to ask everyone in, of the term call out versus call in, because a lot of times with the perpetrator, this, you know, somebody's banding around the term narcissism, it's usually somebody who's, it's about exerting power. It's about a person who has their own insecurities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for the victim, of course, who, um, you know, suffers the, 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 the sense, especially in our profession of failure, because they can control it. Um, what do you think about the term call out versus call in? I'm just curious about that. So I, I honestly don't care what you call it. Just as long as the act actually happens, you know, I think if you want to like, uh, you know, I, you see something, say something, you know, you, yeah. you have to, we have to take care of one another. And I, yeah. you know, it, um, it, uh, it is, uh, you know, especially I think the part, part of the problem is that when people are experiencing this, the majority of people don't see themselves as victims. Um, they see this as you know, normal behavior or, um, you know, maybe not great behavior, but, you know, they don't see the inherent risk of what's going on. In fact, um, something close to 50% of the people who are murdered by their partner have no idea that it's going to happen. Um, and that's because we, as Dr. Lovato says, we make excuses. We, you know, um, normalize the behavior. Um, and so I think that having the person, you know, a bystander, um, call in, call out, whatever, raise the question um, about what's going on um, and, and in a loving and in a curious way, not a, a punitive yeah. or, you know, you are going to fix everything sort of way, but really just opening in a dialogue. The last thing that a victim of intimate partner violence needs is someone else telling them what to do. I mean, that's what's like, wrong with them? Yeah. well, it's, it's a, it's a power thing, right? So if, if, you know, they, they need to feel themselves empowered to change the situation. And I think that's really hard watching as a, as a, a bystander 
bystander because we want to fix the situation. And that's the last thing that the, uh, the, the person needs. Like they, the survivor needs to feel empowered when they have had their power take away. Um, and so, um, but just opening up the conversation with dialogue and curiosity and like, you know, gentle, you know, reorientation of like how, um, things, uh, normal behavior is, and also having, um, resources, whether you're the resource or you have access to the resource, or you have people who could be the resource. Sometimes even the resource is just, you know, being the listening ear, um, you know, that you can sort of, you know, validate their experience, um, so I don't know if that makes sense. So I don't, I don't really on, honestly care whether it's calling yeah. out or calling in. Um, I just want some calling. That's yeah. what I, my, my point was when you phrased it, when you said you do it with <clears throat> curiosity and with support as opposed to, you know, uh, um, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're, the question is like, well, how much is too much? And um, I, I'm curious uh, for, again, someone like yourself, Dr. Lovato, like what was the uh, trigger for you or the final, you know, just curious. What was the light bulb? What was the light bulb? What was your aha moment? Well, you know, I mean, it's awful because my light bulb moment was when that abuse turned physical. And the, the crazy part is that even after that happened, I filed for divorce at that point. Um, I still didn't, go get an order of protection. And I don't know why it took me about four months. Um, and he came back into our home, my home where I was living by myself at that time, um, and was aggressive a second time. And that was, it finally, I, I don't know. I don't know why the light bulb didn't hit sooner. And I think, you know, again, having these resources and, um, being able to read, these are the things that are not normal in a relationship <laughs> over and over and over may, may have helped me, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I really wish I had acted sooner. I think it would have saved uh, a lot of distress um, on the part of myself and my son. So yeah, I would, I would urge people to, you know, to really, really utilize these resources and read about it. Um, it takes a little bit of prodding sometimes to realize you're not in a normal situation. Yeah, I want to take the, the the question over to resources, which is, um, so what what do hospitals, workplaces, what um, you know do, does the college provide? What are what are some of the resources that are out there that you find useful that we can point people to or direct people to as part of this webinar? I will chime in briefly. So uh, you know, again, for me the. Um, the toolkit wasn't available at the time. This was, you know, four years ago when I started going through this. Um, but it is helpful now in reading it. Um, and so I definitely uh, would would tout that. I personally, like I had mentioned earlier, I, I used an app. There's an app called My Plan. Um, and part of it is a series of questions to ask you about your relationship and determine whether or not there are red flags there that you should be thinking more closely about. Um, and then it offers counseling services and domestic violence services, local and national um, resources for you to be able to utilize. You know, the toughest part really uh, is the court system and learning that. Um, but uh, I'm happy to answer any specific questions for anybody uh, about that. The you know unfortunately you know th that's great with the app. Um, the the domestic violence hotline is you know always available. At, at least it can direct you to what resources may exist in your area. Uh, with respect to the hospital, I think it's important. Um, uh, if your staff may be seeking out EAP, Employee Assistance Program, because they those programs typically have um, uh, ways to guide you uh, if you are the victim, uh, of, you know, of intimate partner violence. And and then for the residency, as, as Dr. Sims said earlier, you cannot, cannot, cannot overemphasize the importance of speaking to your program director. That's literally their job to protect you and and ensure and confirm that uh, you are safe and that you are healthy physically and emotionally. So that 
for the residents, that's really a great place to start. Yeah, there are a number of, I mean, in addition to um, the intimate partner violence toolkit that we helped develop for the American College of Surgeons, which I agree is is a great resource. Um, the uh, ACS also has um, additional resources that are, that under the more resources kit uh, or tab that I will put into the chat. Um, there's also the intimate violence, um, I was just looking it up here, um, calculator, the danger assessment calculator, which is a validated tool to figure out not only are you a victim of intimate partner violence, but what is your likelihood of dying from that? And I think that's really important because many people do not assess the risk of death uh, um, when they're in, in these relationships. Uh, and the biggest the biz biggest predictors are whether or not they've threatened to kill you, um, whether there is a gun in the home, whether they and whether they've strangled you or attempted to yeah. stab you. Yeah. So all of those four things are like if any of those are currently happening in your relationship, like you are at significant risk for dying uh, and need to get out that quickly. So I think that that's um, you know really you know. Um, really important and to not minimize um, things and, and norm normalize them um, is really the uh, an important thing. Those are the resources that are sort of available online. And then as uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph said, you know, really working with your residency director, um, the American College of Surgeons is uh, investigating uh, the possibility of having some peer-to-peer -peer, um, counseling that would provide at least you know, an, an anonymous person to talk to, um, and then really seeking out the resources in your own institute, your own um, geographically located areas. Because as uh, Dr. Lovato mentioned, the, the rules um, and the protections change on a state-by-state -state level. It's not a national thing. And so knowing the, the rules that, that uh, govern where you live is very important. And you can get those through the National Domestic Hotline. So, you know, what, what I often hear, and I think that that is why this is can be sometimes very challenging for the victims, is that there's a lot of this is about you taking control and going to going to make that call, going to use that app, you know, and and sometimes I just don't know if uh, 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 people are there. So one place that you can start is your your friend your colleague saying i have a problem and you'd be surprised um first of all you have to recognize it, of course but if you don't feel safe and you don't feel happy and if you're walking on eggshells and and uh then, then there's a problem and then reaching out to a person who is close to you or even not necessarily close to you uh that may be the way to be the kickstart for you to start saying uh, well, I'm going to make that call. I'm going to make this thing because I think, uh, at least in my experience, what I've seen with some people, they just sort of, they they sort of fold in into themselves and they continue to do that as they are basically stripped of all uh, sense of power or sense of of, of value. Um, I was going to add something about you know I, I just kind of slipped my mind. Um, you know, I, I think you you know just getting online and ma making sure that even when you're online, that you're in a place that is safe to do it, because there are situations sometimes you may find that you have to do it at work, because you know that person may have control of your cell phone, or they can see what you've you've actually done. So you actually want to do these things in a place that's away from um, uh, that uh, assailant. Oh yeah, I was going to say this. If you know, you may be surprised to find that the the, when uh, the intimate partner violence ultimately leads to homicide or murder-suicide, that doesn't necessarily mean that that was the intent of the perpetrator to begin with. So that you may, as the victim, think, oh, well, that's not going to happen. That's not the kind of person. But there are validated studies that demonstrate there are certain things that are associated with leading to homicide. And Dr. Sims said them very clearly. Uh, the, the, the choking is a big one. Um, um, you know, it just comes to mind because I know that was one of the uh, precursors for one of one of my colleagues. But um, uh, so do not be do not dismiss these tools, these calculators, because these are validated studies that have demonstrated that these things do end in homicide. 
Um, I think we touched on it briefly, I, but I also want to just, um, this is a question in the chat and I want to just address it. Um, it. One of the questions is saying, you know, that um, therapy and getting therapy are really important both for the perpetrator and the victim early on in the course. Um, while other protective measures are being taken, it's, it's important to engage in therapy. Um, what is your sort of comment about that or how um, have you, you know, how do you approach it in therapy or how do you approach finding a therapist? Uh, so a lot of these resources that we, that we talked about, um, they can put you in touch with low cost or sometimes even free uh, therapy. Um, and, you know, part of the, the most difficult part of getting through something like this, um, if you're helping someone, a colleague, or if you're going through it yourself, is I had a, a friend of mine who uh, is a nurse who messaged me about this yesterday, actually. Um, and she said the hardest part was surviving the survival, um, you know, and starting therapy early um, is important. Um, and, and making sure that if you're that friend or that colleague and you're helping them through this dangerous situation, please know that they're going to need you for a long time um, after that um, in regards to that support. So I think this is an, also another opportunity to sort of highlight the resources that exist at individual hospitals. Each hospital is required to have an employee, employee assistance program, and that includes access to mental health. Um, and so, you know, when you go to these employment uh, uh, programs, um, it's protected, like it's, it's HIPAA protected, no one knows that you're going, no one has access to those records. Um, and so I think that, you know, all of those fears of that having to be tracked back to your program or to who you are, um, are real fears, but not really substantiated by the data. So going to your employment employee assistant program um, can actually get you into a fast track for a mental health provider. And often that happens within a day or two. So I would really encourage people to sort of seek that out. And then if you require more than the three or four uh, sessions that they provide, they can actually get you tapped into um, uh, mental health services and support that is like a, like you mentioned, Dr. Lovato, at low cost or often covered by our insurance um, that we're also mandated to have as employees of the hospital. So, um, you know, really seek that out as well. And then, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Lovato, there are, if you go through the domestic hotline services that are within your community, they awful, also will get you um, set up with um uh, psychology or psychiatry uh, for support. And remember that these things are um, confidential and that, um, mm -hmm. you know, they can be held accountable for making your personal information uh, public so that you should feel safe to seek out these resources uh, because uh, the uh, institution can be liable for sharing information that you have shared confidentially. So it's important to remember that as well. And uh, yeah. sorry, sorry, Dr. Bonnie. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, and just also like if if there are issues with you actually having time to get off to take those appointments, those are also again protected through the FMLA Act. So um, you know, there you have recourse uh, to to get help, um, and uh, you know to hopefully it doesn't come to that where they're like you need to invoke your FMLA, but if it does, then you actually are protected federally. Right. Yeah, I think it's just an important additive to the whole conversation about normalizing mental health resources and normalizing um, uh, seeking, you know, mental health if it's needed in um, among surgeons and in surgery and in medicine and in life in general. Um, the normalization of this conversation. And Go in ahead. general, everybody needs mental yeah. health in general. You know, so um, you know, yeah, that. that um, we are set, we are from the group where you know we fix everything, we do everything, and you know we don't want to. But but absolutely, being able to um, take care of your own mental health is so essential. And I like that phrase of survive the surviving. You know that that's a great phrase because I think sometimes for those of us on the outside, we look and we go, well, you know, this person got out, we saved another one, and we forget it's a lifelong recovery almost. And um, so thank you for reminding us about that. 
So I have one other question here in the chat that I think also it's a kind of a long um, a thread that brings up a bunch of uh, different issues. So I'm gonna try to parse them out. The first is that there is, um, this post is from a male surgeon who uh, has been victimized by emotional, psychological abuse and, um, and was coerced into doing things that uh, threatened their medical license. Um, so it sounds like this, in this case, the abuser was, um, coercing them into, per, um, prescribing medications for them. Yeah. So, um, the question is, I, it, so I think this brings up a really interesting point about men, um, also being, uh, victims of IPV, which we forget sometimes, um, about, uh, men and about, um, certainly LGBTQ is, is a very high risk population as well. Um, and then the other um, thing I think this brings about is, you know, what happens if something that you've done or something gets out of control and for some reason your professional license is threatened? How do you go back and, you know, explain that to your future employers and, and you know, and kind of rebuild your professional presence in addition to sort of rebuilding what you have to personally? But, you know. I'm just, I, don't, I just wanted to jump in for a second because I think, yes, I, you know, we forget it's one in four women, one in seven men who are victims. And if I look at the question, the person also mentioned physical because we often think, um, you know, women cannot be physical, but yeah, absolutely, the women can be. Um, the We are still so early, unfortunately, in the course of really acknowledging intimate partner violence, acknowledging mental health uh, as an important part of who we are. And I think the courts are even further behind. While I think there's certain strides towards uh, making that better, uh, the courts are even further behind because for the person who has lost their license, I'm not even sure if we have something to address that. You know, how do we, because ultimately it's going to be you are the person who lost your license and created this act. And how do you translate that into, well, I was a victim who was being manipulated and controlled. And, you know, I don't know that there is anything that allows for that, it, it, you know, except for a sympathetic em, em, employer. Uh, you can certainly fight uh, uh, your course, your, your case in, in court, but that, I think is another opportunity with our legal system on the recognition that this is a real syndrome where this person is, their their, their thoughts, their feelings are subjugated to someone else's. And um, I don't know if you have any experience with this, any of the panelists here, because that that's really tragic amongst all the other tragedies, of course. But Well, I, I think, I think that, um, I mean, that is awful uh, because I, you know, I think that we can all go down the rabbit hole of, you know, thinking that we're helping um, and we're placating and, you know, again, normalizing, um, you know, this kind of behavior. I think, um, you know, for the person who is the victim, uh, uh, this gentleman, the surgeon, um, you know, again, it, you, ha you have to recognize that this is not normal, that you were a victim and there were consequences. Um, and so again, working with either your, your you know, faculty affairs, um, uh, vice chief of faculty affairs for either your division or your department or the hospital and, and sort of coming, you know, exposing yourself, which has got to be hard. Like it's got, it's like, you know, so in order to do that, I would recommend that you actually also um, concurrently uh, seek professional help, mental services, because that is, that is a hard, like that is a hard thing to do on your own and you're going to need support um, both um, from a mental health perspective and also just, again, having someone to touch touch base and, and, and help you through this. Um, and then I would recommend that you, um, you know, you could get legal support, you could get a legal or get a lawyer and then go to the board of medicine and let them know and self-report that you've done this. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the last thing you want is as you're going, at, you're leaving this person, that they then report you and they, um, you know, they get the, they control the narrative then. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you go and say, this is what was happening, 
um, you know, I'm getting help. Um, you know, this is my path forward, but I want you to know that I did this. And then they'll do some monitoring over the next how many years and um, you won't lose your license. Whereas if you don't self-report and you don't, you know, go get help, that person who may become, who's victimized you already may become very vindictive and, you know, report stuff to the board of medicine that then will challenge your licensure. Um, so, you know, I think in one of these ones, these circumstances is super hard, but the, the best path forward is just the truth. Like what happened, how it shook out, you know, what your plan forward is, you know, and getting the help that you need to sort of support you through this. Because, um, you know, we had a similar situation where like, you know, I, you know, a, a faculty member had, done some stuff that, you know, wasn't necessarily on the up and up. And, um, you know, we, we went to our legal, we went to the, the board of medicine and we sort of showed the plan and then it also protects you. So if that person then comes up with other dirty laundry, which may or may not be true, um, you're sort of, it's all laid out already and you're protected because you don't want them to victimize you even more um, after you've left the relationship. I, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to the person who has that question. I'm really sorry. That sounds like a really. Yeah. I, I think the idea is about taking problem. back self, con taking back control. But if you, I don't know if Dr. Bonnie, you're the one to read this, but this person says that they, in fact, did report it and um, still lost their license, which is, again, a, de a demonstration of how the, uh, the legal system is bit behind. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think for male victims, it is uh, uh, even even more challenging, to be honest. You're you're on mute, Doctor. Yeah. So I think we're going to go ahead um, and wrap up. Um, so does anybody have any uh, other comments that they'd like to make before we wrap up? I, I want to say that the fact that this is one in four and one in seven, this is very real. Uh, this could be the person next to you, the person with whom you work. And, um, you know, and, and for myself, just recently, you know, I've had different experiences throughout, but recently I, just finding a, a close friend being uh, subject to this, it's still a little bit um, uh, unsettling. And I cannot, and I'm uncomfortable speaking about it, so I cannot say how much I'm impressed and thankful and grateful to Dr. Lovato for coming on here and saying, you know, I, you know, I'm a surgeon, I'm badass, and oh, by the way. <laughs> so just, you know, that that's just all I got to say about that. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dr. Joseph. Uh, I was honored to be given this opportunity by Dr. Turner and Dr. Bass. So um, again, just hope that I can continue to be a voice. And uh, really, I just want to say anyone who's listening out there, again, you know, the the panel has already stated this multiple times, just just be there, be a be a, a an ear, a listening ear. Um, you know, if you are a program director or a chair or a division chief or, you know, uh, whatever uh, area of power you have in that regard, in that program, you know, please make it um, very easy for your surgeons to come forward with this. Um, create a culture that uh, allows us to talk about it. That's all I ask. So I guess my concluding comment would be to, um, again, thank the American College of Surgeons for taking this um, topic seriously and really um, being a champion for, for surgeons who are experiencing it. And again, to really extend my um, gratitude to Dr. Lovato uh, for helping uh, shed a light and also by telling her story and by um, sort of helping us normalize this and to talk about it, to bring it out of the darkness. Um, because I think, you know, until we do that, until it becomes part of the, the mainstream uh, to, to have these conversations, we will continue to um, have suffering. 
And so I'm, I'm really so very grateful, Dr. Lovato, for your courage. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much. And I also um, just want to uh, thank Dr. Barbara Bass for getting this um, task force up and running several years ago um, in memory of a great friend and great surgeon, Dr. Sherilyn Gordon Burroughs, who was um, killed by her husband, um, who we uh, is always sort of front of mind when we have these activities and these discussions. Um, so thank you uh, for all of your time today um, to answer these questions and disseminate this important information to our surgical community. The recording of today's website will be available or today's webinar will be posted to the ACS website. If anyone would like more information or resources, please visit the Intimate Partner Violence Task Force listed on the screen. Um, we have resources for you. And if you have any questions about this webinar or about the IPV task force in general, please contact uh, Jesse Romance. Her, her email is listed there on the screen. And thank you all for joining us today.